Rico's governor says he's stepping down, but protesters promise to keep up the fight. 120 movements and parties are in Caracas for the Sao Paulo Forum. And Europe swelters in record temperatures as scientists report we now have the hottest weather in 2,000 years. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Doris Polo in Quito and this is From the South. The governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosello, has announced he will step down on the 2nd of August after a week and a half of mass protests to demand his resignation. The news brought an explosion of celebrations on the streets of the capital. The protesters had been waiting for the governor to accept he had to go since Tuesday night. The protests were triggered by revelations of a chat controlled by Rosello, where he and his officials made insulting and misogynistic comments. But they grew to express widespread frustration at the government's handling of the economic crisis. This is an historic step forward, but now we'll go for the junta against all the corrupt officials to get rid of them as the people. It's completely fair. It's what he should have done from the start, before making us suffer. But he finally did it. We are celebrating. We are super happy. We have shown the people can do it when they unite. Ricky is leaving not just for all the obscenities and insults on the chat, but also for the corruption we've suffered for decades. This is a turning point. Puerto Rico will now be respected. It's good that he's going. Speaking on television, Governor Rosello said his resignation will come into effect at 5 p.m. on August 2nd in order to allow a smooth power transition. He named Justice Secretary Wanda Vasquez as the new governor. He finally conceded to the pressure after the legislature began an impeachment process against him. And as protesters kept up the pressure outside the government offices in La Fortaleza. With sadness, I am announcing that I will be resigning from the position of governor effective on Friday, August 2nd, 2019, at 5 in the afternoon. In the coming days, I will be attending to pending issues to facilitate an order. At this moment, I am fulfilling my mandate to allow for the succession process established by our Constitution, to swear in at the moment the person who will complete my term. We are now joined by Rafael Benabe, who is on the phone right now. He continues to march with thousands of Puerto Ricans through the streets of San, San Juan. Hello, Rafael. Thanks for joining us. Uh, hi, thank you for having me. So tell us, what is the aim of the citizens' movement now after the governor announced his resignation? Well, today we are celebrating. There's a huge march which was called before his resignation, but people decided that it was important to have it anyway. And, of course, the problem that we face right now is that the uh, ruling party, the party of, of former Governor Rosselló, is still in power. And that party has an agenda which includes uh, neoliberal policies such as privatization of the public school system, cutting the budget of the public university, cutting pensions, and so on. All of this in order to pay for Puerto Rico's public debt, which is uh, unpayable. It can only be paid by imposing terrible sacrifices on the people. And the policy of paying that debt is... Uh, is um, overseen by a, uh, a board, a board appointed by the Congress of the United States, which we call La Junta. So what we face now is a need to to, uh, to transfer the struggle that we have led uh, victoriously against Governor Rosselló and to turn that into a struggle against the Junta and against the austerity policies of the Junta and against the neoliberal policies of the government and the Junta. And uh, people are very, very uh, enthusiastic about this victory, and we are very confident that we will be able now, on the basis of this victory, to, to continue that struggle in the next uh, year, in the next few months. So, Rafael, do you think that Wanda Vasquez is up to the task of taking over from the governor? No, absolutely not. Wanda Vasquez is the Secretary of Justice of Puerto Rico. She has already been mentioned in relation to several uh, scandals, for example, hiding evidence 
uh, in cases that would could hurt uh, the government in the past. She has also has a very she had a very uh, prominent role in prosecuting students uh, of the University of Puerto Rico who have participated in strikes at the University of Puerto Rico. And some of these students, because of their participation in the strike, they have been accused of vandalism and all sorts of uh, of um, supposed uh, illegal actions, which are fabrications, and she has been in, uh, involved in that. And one of, one of the slogans of the people in the street today uh, it was, Wanda Vasquez is next. That is, to, you know, meaning that if she tries to maintain the policy that Rosselló maintained in the past, people are going to be very soon in the street protesting against her as well. Okay, so what happens now with the impeachment process that began yesterday? Well, the, the impeachment process, now that he has resigned, the impeachment process uh, stops because the impeachment process is required in case he remains in office in order to remove him from office. So, so now that he has uh, resigned or will resign very, you know, will, will move out of the office very soon on August 2, the impeachment process uh, really doesn't have any function. What does, what does have a function is the fact that the report made for the legislature indicated that the government may have committed several uh, illegal acts. And that has to go to the Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice has to investigate if, in fact, the governor has broken the law. And if he has broken the law, then he has to be accused. He has, he has to be indicted uh, for these uh, uh, illegal actions, and uh, there has to be a trial. And he may even go to jail uh, because of some of these uh, illegal actions. So the impeachment process as such stops. The investigation of possible illegal actions uh, is still there, has to be completed, and we will see what, uh, you know, what the results of that is. Thank you so much, Rafael, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So the 25th Sao Paulo Forum is underway in Venezuela. Around 700 delegates from over 120 social movements and leftist parties from around the world are in Caracas to participate in the event, which lasts until Sunday. Under the slogan, For the Peace, Sovereignty and Prosperity of the Peoples, the forum will focus on the Colombian peace process, the movement to free the former Brazilian president, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, and the U.S. economic blockades against Cuba and Venezuela. There will also be workshops and talks about indigenous and Afro-Latino issues, social justice and journalism in the region. The forum was launched by the Workers' Party of Brazil in 1990 in the city of Sao Paulo and it serves as a platform to share alternatives to neoliberalism. Our correspondent Leonel Reitamal is at the forum and sent this report. We're here at the opening of the Sao Paulo Forum, the 25th edition, which is taking place here in Caracas. Here at the Alba Caracas Hotel, the debates and discussions are already underway. They'll continue for four days until Sunday, the 28th of July. Among the central topics is the question of peace, both in Venezuela and in Colombia and in the wider world. And of course, as always at the Sao Paulo Forum, They'll be talking about the situation of the left and how it can promote an alternative for the people. To talk about this, we have a guest, Asir Altuna, from the left in the Basque country. So, Asir, how do you see the situation of the left in Europe and the world, and how does that relate to Latin America? I think the left has a huge challenge because we have a systematic crisis in the world. We have to face all the different crises, the environmental crisis, the role of imperialism. We also have the rise of a new wave of feminism against new expressions of machismo. So the left has to study and understand all of this so it can come up with appropriate answers, especially as we see the extreme right also gaining strength. For example, in Europe, that's the big challenge to create a real, feasible alternative. Some of the media are also saying that this forum is being watched carefully by the right, too. What is the importance of the Sao Paulo Forum now, after all these years? There is no doubt at all that the Sao Paulo Forum is a fundamental point of reference internationally for the left, and insofar as the left can develop a coherent strategy, then it is the right who are the most concerned about that. The right tries to divide the left, 
That is why they attack the Sao Paulo Forum. For us, it's very important to be here and to be involved in these discussions on strategy that are relevant for five continents. And one of our causes has to be that of peace. We'll take a short break now. Don't go away. Actions have an impact on the environment. It's our responsibility to change for the sake of our planet. Let's be part of this transition. Watch, preserve, and protect your green zone. Wednesday, only on Telesur. It is six months since a dam in the Brazilian town of Brumandino collapsed and took the life of 270 people. The dam was owned by the Valle mining company Valle and relatives are still demanding justice. Our correspondent Andre Vieira is in Brumandino. Hello, we are reporting from Brumandino, a city here in the southeast of Brazil. That's exactly six months ago was devastated by one of the gravest environmental crimes ever in Brazil. A dam of the mining company Vale collapsed and took the lives of about 200 people. The family members of those victims are meeting in the city to remember their loved ones in a commemorative event. This tragedy is considered an environmental crime and not an accident. As the family members of the victims point out, that the mining company Vale knew about the dangers and risks of those mining activities. They also say their family members were not given proper security measures for the work they did. That is why they consider this a crime, a foreseeable crime which Vale knew could happen. So today these people are meeting here in Brumandinho to remember the victims of this tragedy, but most importantly to demand justice for those who are seeking compensation from the mining company. So today is a very special day for these people, while various social movements are here to show their support and demand justice for this crime. The Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is on the second day of an official visit to Cuba. The minister held talks with former president and first secretary of the Communist Party of Cuba, Raul Castro. Following their meeting, Castro and Larov took part in the opening ceremony of the Statue of the Republic in Havana's National Capitol Building, which a team of Russian experts helped to restore. Minister Lavrov also met his Cuban counterpart, Bruno Rodriguez, at the beginning of the day. The two of them then spoke to the media. Police in Peru have violently repressed protesters who have been demonstrating against the Tia Maria mining project in the Arequipa region. Police used tear gas to disperse the protesters who had gathered on the Pan American Highway. One person was arrested during the protests while several others sustained injuries. Since the 15th of July, Thousands of Tambo Valley residents have been mobilizing against the mining project. They say the project will have negative consequences on the environment and agriculture. In El Salvador, rural women are being taught how to cultivate healthy food for their families by planting crops from the past. The social organizations behind the program are ultimately teaching them the importance of food sovereignty. Juana Morales grows plants in her garden that have been long forgotten. With the help of the Association for the Development of Communities in Chalatenango Department, she grows turmeric, chaya, also known as tree spinach, and moringa, known to many as drumstick tree. This contributes to her family's health. 
We've learned how to produce and harvest our food. There's no food sovereignty or food security in our country. We heavily depend on imported goods, but if we start producing our own food, then we can have a much healthier diet and lifestyle. Some 300 women from eight municipalities across the department of Chalatenango have joined the program. It teaches them how to produce healthy food at home. We want to educate the population, and through women we can reach their entire families, so people will only eat organic food and not junk food, like most families in our department currently do. There is a food security bill proposal, but it's currently stuck in the bureaucratic process of the Legislative Assembly. Critics say many lawmakers are reluctant to pass the bill because they're defending the interests of multinational corporations. It is not convenient for businessmen to have a food sovereignty law, but maybe social pressure will force the passage of the bill in the future. Still, it is possible that food security would now mean plenty of food without knowing its origin. The program doesn't only assist with the cultivation of different plants, it also teaches people how to cook the food they've grown themselves. So traditional Salvadoran dishes like las pupusas, made with cheese, beans and pork, can be made with homegrown organic ingredients. If you grow moringa or turmeric, you can make it from them, but it also works with beetroot or carrot, but then of course the dough will have a different color and the taste will also change slightly. The organizers hope that with the help of this program, families will slowly replace imported supermarket products with homegrown organic food and thus maintain a much healthier lifestyle. More stories coming up when we come back. News that Tunisia's president passed away at 92. Stay with us. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. On Monday, only on Venezuela. Welcome back. Tunisia's president, Beji Kade Esebsi, has passed away, according to a post to the official Facebook page of the presidency. He was 92 years old and the oldest sitting president. Esebsi was hospitalized on Wednesday, but officials did not say why. Last month, he was also admitted for what officials said was a severe health crisis. Earlier this year, Esebsi announced that he would not participate in the country's November elections. The 92-year-old won Tunisia's first free elections in 2014, following Arab uprisings across the region. The United States has blocked an attempt by Indonesia, South Africa and Kuwait to get the United Nations Security Council to condemn the demolitions of Palestinian homes by Israeli authorities. The three countries had prepared and circulated a draft statement that condemned and expressed grave concerns over the demolitions. The U.S. delegation, however, rejected the statement. The U.S. government has on numerous occasions opposed and vetoed U.N. bills and statements that are no critical of the Israeli government. Or interpretation in order to criticize. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani has said his government remains open to negotiations with any country as long as they are done in a manner that respects the sovereignty and dignity of Iran. We will never miss the opportunity for negotiation. As long as I'm responsible for the executive affairs of the country, as long as I'm president, I announce that we are always ready for fair and legal negotiations with complete respect to Iranian nation, Iranian nation's right and dignity in order to solve the problems. 
tacit. But at the same time, we are not ready to sit at the table of surrender under the name of negotiations. We totally understand the meaning of negotiation and the meaning of surrender. We do not allow for surrender, and our nation also does not accept it. Our constitution does not accept it too, but we have always been ready for fair and respectful negotiation, which leads to a fair result, and we are ready for it too. Spain might be heading for its fourth national election in as many years as the parliament has rejected socialist leader Pedro Sanchez's second bid to be confirmed as prime minister. Sanchez has until mid-September to win parliament's backing. However, his party said they would give up trying to install him if he failed to secure confirmation this month. The socialist party won an election in April but fell short of a majority. It needed the support of the left-wing Unidas Podemos to be confirmed, but the two parties failed to reach a deal on a coalition government. Negotiations became deadlocked on the role Podemos would play in a coalition government. I'm very sorry to confirm that the parliamentary blockage remains. Ladies and gentlemen, lawmakers, since my first address, I said that my goal was to form a government, a progressive government with a premise which was to do everything possible so that Spain's government doesn't have to depend exclusively on support of separatist forces. Before anything, I have to say that between left-wing forces, the government investiture should have been guaranteed since from the first instance, because election results of April 28 and of May 26 left clear the will expressed by Spanish people that the government should be led by the Socialist Party. The United Kingdom's newly appointed Prime Minister Boris Johnson has chaired his first cabinet meeting since his appointment. His cabinet reshuffle has seen the appointment of far-right pro-Brexit ministers, including 13 newcomers. More than half of Theresa May's old cabinet, including leadership rival Jeremy Hunt, quit or was sacked by Johnson. Dozens of logistics and transport workers in the Italian city of Milan have protested against their conditions of service. The workers drawn from different labor unions are demanding for higher wages and an end to subcontracting, among other issues. They have accused the government of turning a blind eye to their concerns. They are also angered by the government's decision to exclude unions from participating in the formulation of a proposed plan for the transport sector. Western Europe is facing its second record-breaking heat wave in a month, undoubtedly due to climate change. Temperatures reached 41 degrees Celsius in Paris as a red alert was issued in northern France. In the UK, July had a record temperature of 36.9 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, on Thursday, the Netherlands recorded its highest ever temperature at 36 degrees. Germany and Belgium broke their national heat records too. A report just published in Nature notes that the world's temperature has increased to its highest in 2,000 years, undermining climate skeptics' questioning of mankind's role in global warming. So when we planned Paris, we did not expect this at all. I'm so glad that we booked Airbnb and had air conditioning available because I know some other people didn't get that. But it, we've had such a good time. The Parisians have been so accommodating. We've been getting water wherever we go. We got to play in the fountain. This was amazing. We're really having a good time. We got up early this morning to enjoy Paris in the morning. A backpack full of water bottles and now we're about to get our feet wet. And then we'll continue visiting until 5 p.m. in the afternoon. It was only a year ago that Greece suffered the worst wildfire disaster in living memory. 102 people died in Mati outside Athens. This year, the community was determined to remember those it lost. On the 23rd of July 2018, the most devastating wildfires in Greece this century killed 102 people. Hundreds of homes were burned and thousands were forced to flee. This year, a tribute to the victims was planned, but a new fire at Rafina nearby raised the alarm and the program was changed. Luckily, the fire died out and the commemoration went ahead. We are here to honor the memory of our dead, of all who died in that fire, and above all, our 16 neighbors who died right here. 
Neighbors headed down the hill following the roots of the fire, which destroyed everything. They reached the little port of Mati, where a year ago, thousands of people saved themselves by jumping into the sea. There, they paid homage. Relatives of most of the dead were present. We lost people. We lost our nature. We lost homes and property. But we are still here, in our good paradise. What made this place so magic? Because for us, it is still magic in spite of that catastrophe. The most moving moment was when they read the names of the 102 who were killed. Friends, relatives and neighbors couldn't hold back the tears. As well as remembering the dead, those present had something to say to the authorities who turned up. They want someone to take responsibility, something they say has never happened. They burn us, they abandon us, and absolutely nothing has happened. We're still waiting. We escaped by just five minutes. The house was burning and my cat saved us. He woke us from our siesta and we fled, my wife, my children, and myself. The commemoration was almost canceled because of the new fire. It brought terrible memories, but it also raised the question, how sure can we be that something similar will not happen again? And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on Stars at Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And join us on social media. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.